Manager Meetings is brought to you by Canalyst, the leading destination for public company data and analysis. Tons of funds we know use Canalysts to get exactly what you'd want for analytical work on companies. They have detailed company-specific models on over 4,000 global equities with clean data, timely adjustments, and relevant KPIs. And each one is available at the click of a button. I've personally found Canalyst models especially helpful as a primer for important positions in advance of manager meetings. So no surprise that their client roster includes a host of allocators too. If you haven't checked out Canalyst recently, I strongly suggest you do. They've been busy extending coverage, building sector-specific dashboards, and just launched a data science library for systematic investors. Sign up for your free trial at canalyst.com slash TED. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Manager Meetings. This show is an exploration of investment opportunities. Through conversations with money managers conducted by one of the manager's institutional clients, we'll share the stories and strategies that attracted their attention and capital. You can learn more and join our mailing list at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted, guest hosts, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators, the firms of guest hosts, or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On today's manager meeting, I interviewed John Barber, the managing partner of Cohesive Capital, a $1 billion private equity firm founded in 2010 to focus exclusively on private and growth equity co-investments. Cohesive executes its strategy without investing in funds and without paying a carry to sponsors. Our conversation covers John's early career in investment banking, the evolution of the industry, and the launch of Cohesive Capital. We dive into Cohesive's investment philosophy, deal structure, sourcing, and team. We then discuss his advice for other co-investors and opportunities and risks in today's market. Please enjoy my manager meeting with John Barber from Cohesive Capital. John, great to see you. Great to see you, Ted. Thanks very much for having me. Why don't we just start, take me back to your background as far back as you want to go, childhood, early career, and just go from there. Sure. I grew up in a small town in Westchester County, Dobbs Ferry, New York. It was an interesting town and it was a great place to grow up. I think a lot of my ability to interface and interrelate with people is from meeting a lot of different kinds of people as a kid. I had an interesting family life. I was the youngest of four children by a lot. My two sisters are 11 years older than me and my brother's eight years. So being a caboose sort of has the best of being both an only kid, but also having brothers and sisters. And then probably most amazing is I had two parents who were ridiculously smart and educated. I had a father who was a PhD from Harvard in sociology and taught at Columbia University for 35 years. And probably much more amazingly, I had a mother who was a PhD in Harvard in history and worked her whole life, including 17 years of the Ford Foundation. So she was a real inspiration. And while I certainly went in a very different direction, what I learned from them was not what I do today. It was an interesting uh, home life. It was uh, different than a lot of sometimes my, what I think are some of my brethren in finance. So how did you go about getting into the business and learning it? You know, I guess I always had a desire to work uh, more than to study and learn. I loved cars as a kid. I bought my first car at 14 years old, started taking it apart. There was a Peugeot dealership in my hometown. I worked there after school. I worked there all summer. I worked almost every summer. And so I like to work and I like to do. I wasn't one of these kids who said, oh, I like the stock market, or I read the Wall Street Journal, or I understood finance. I just sort of thought I somehow liked business as opposed to academia. Maybe, you know, you go in the opposite direction. So I went to Tufts University and you know, I studied political science, but I took economics. But then there was a corporate finance class. There was a decision-making class. There was an industrial psychology class. And I tried to make my sort of own business degree. Nobody came to Tufts to recruit at all. 
but I was, I was interested. I got a mail job, a job in the mail room at Wertheim and Company for two different summers and actually learned quite a lot being in the mail room at Wertheim and Company. It was a small investment bank, very well capitalized, major bracket firm run by the Klingenstein family. And I would deliver the mail and I'd go into the corporate finance department and I'd go into the executive group and I'd go into the equity sales and trading group and I'd go into the fixed income group. And I got to understand what different parts were a little bit in an investment bank, but with not much education. And so that then spurred me on and I kept looking. I, I always joked, I became quite friendly with a guy named Jay Fishman, who was the CEO of Travelers, who had worked at City with us. And I told him that I had applied to a job at Travelers Insurance. It went down to Hartford, interviewed and got turned down. I said, you know, Jay, if I'd gotten that job, I'd still be working for you. And he said, John, one thing I know is you definitely wouldn't still be working for me. <laughs> you wouldn't have lasted much more than 18 months of the Travelers Insurance Company in Hartford, Connecticut. But uh, I then got lucky. I had someone I knew who got me a job at Drexel Burnham. What year was that? June of 1983, one week after college. And actually started $14,000, first job in the syndicate operations group. This person wasn't trying to help me a lot. They were just trying to help me a little. But we sat on the trading floor right next to the syndicate department. And back then, syndicate did any equity deal, any preferred deal, any high-grade deal, any high-yield deal. All that was sort of where the risk was taken. And if you go back in time, John Goodfriend, the legendary CEO of Solomon Brothers, had been the syndicate manager of Solomon Brothers. Ralph Denunzio, the legendary CEO of Kidder Peabody, had been the syndicate manager. Tommy Saunders, a very legendary Morgan Stanley investment banker, had been the syndicate manager. That was where people really made their names back in the 70s and 80s. And it really led, frankly, to, to my career. So the simple answer is I somehow managed to get friendly enough with the guys in the real syndicate department, not the operations group, to move over and become a syndicate guy. And that then got me a lot of exposure to two things. One, more parts of the capital structure for a guy who had really no training. And two, what really makes me sort of love my job today is what I loved back then, which is one day I might be doing oil and gas, the next day doing a retailer, next doing technology, next day doing an insurance company, next day doing a REIT, you know, all different kinds of stuff. I love that breadth. And back then, being a generalist was much more typical. Even investment bankers were pretty much generalists. The days of, oh, I only do healthcare, I only do media, I only do energy, I only do this, really established much more in the, in the early 90s. And there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also some detriment. And so one of the benefits to us today is that I grew up for 40 years now looking at all different kinds of companies and what makes a good company and a bad company and a good management and a bad management. So I worked my way up. And by the way, over time, what was one group of syndicate really broke into parts. And at each firm, you would have a equity group and a high grade debt group and a leverage finance group. And those people also started to become half syndicate people, half bankers. So you started to be that if the firm had an equity deal to pitch, you would go pitch that that deal to the company. I'll never forget, you know, 26 years old, going with some senior people up to see Ron Perlman, Howard Giddes, and Don Drapkin after they had just bought Revlon to talk to them about taking National Health Labs, one of the big testing companies, public as to help pay down the debt of the Revlon LBO and being totally petrified as I sat as the main speaker talking to Ron Perlman right across the table. You know, it was a great, great experience. I learned a lot, dealt with a lot of companies that learned how to do a lot of different things, deal with sales, deal with trading, deal with banking, deal with research. That was the other thing about being right in the heart of this, which was you not only had all these industries, but you dealt with all the parts of the firm, got to learn all kinds of what everybody did and learned how to make everybody work together. And that was really important. Drexel had an interesting history from there through the late 80s, early 90s. You know, you went from there to a couple other banks before, you know, a while back starting Cohesive. What was different in the cultures of the various places you sat? I was at Drexel. As I said, it was sort of like landing on Mars. When I got there, it was good. And the people were pretty good. But then 84, 85, 86, 87, obviously it was just an amazing place to work. When you look at all the people who ended up working at Drexel, some who were there, have they gone into private equity? Have they gone into credit? Just unbelievably. And I don't really know how it happened, but it shows that culture and workplace and what's going to be done attracts people. It was attracting two kinds of people. Some people who were younger, who had already worked at a Payne Weber or a Prue or a Shearson or a this or that, very rarely from a Solomon or from a Goldman or from a Morgan. And then it was attracting people out of business school. Bennett Goodman, as an example, I remember him as a first year associate and he was special when he was a first year associate. There were people there like Josh Friedman from Canyon, who's a legend. And obviously Mark Rowan came and Josh Harris came and Leon was already there. And Allison Mass, Bomarito, who's been a, a legendary banker at Goldman Sachs, covering the sponsor world. There was just tons and tons of amazing people there uh, to get to know and to learn from. Now, to be honest with you, I was a little second-class citizen. You know, if you remember Michael Lewis's book, 
Liars Poker, you know, what was the worst thing? Equities in Dallas at Salmon Brothers. That was where they sent the bad people. Well, it wasn't totally the case at Drexel, but if you were in banking slash M&A, that was elite. If you were in high yield and in Beverly Hills, that was elite. And if you were on the equity trading floor, you were probably a little less elite. But it was a great place to learn and to meet people. And it was a great place to also realize what doesn't go right at places and how cultures can get out of whack and how controls need to be in place. Sadly, we did go out of business. And some of that was... When you do as well as you do, you put a target on your back. Some of it was you got to be cleaner than clean. And some of it was learning that, you know, you have to live through the bottom. One of the beauties of private equity is we build capital structures where we hopefully can hold on to these companies, even if things go wrong in the company or wrong in the macro. And one of the things most people don't know is not only did every lender to Drexel Burnham get all their money back, we as equity holders got all our money back at the end of the day. It was a short-term downturn in the high-yield market with too much concentration, but you got to be able to live through the bottom and you also learn that leverage works both ways. So I then went to Kidder Peabody. The only thing similar to Kidder Peabody to Rexel Burnham was, at least from an equity standpoint, we were the underdog. We are competing against Goldman, against Morgan, against Merrill, against other people and, and struggling. It was, a, it was a neat firm, good people. A lot of really good people have come out of there too. I got a really great opportunity. I got to run equity capital markets at age 27. I always joke it was a little more about what they didn't know than what I did. But I got to be on the firm's investment committee. I got to hire people for the first time. I, again, worked throughout the firm. And then I really got lucky. The CEO was a guy named Mike Carpenter. Mike was very important and has been important in my life. And then Kidder was really not destined for success. Very frankly, you know, GE had bought it. They'd been a good M&A firm who had sold off most of their good M&A clients over time. They were relying a little bit on GE's balance sheet and a little bit on a fixed income division to sort of support the other ones. And then we hit the 94 Times and Joe Jet and some other things. And I go over to the second firm that went out of business. I mean, we technically sold to Payne Weber, but we were really out of business. And then moved over to Smith Barney. And Smith Barney wasn't that different than Kidder. Pretty sleepy. Sandy had bought the firm. He would brought Lou Glucksman in. He would brought Bob Greenhill in. It was a pretty bizarre whole situation going on. But uh, got to help run equity capital markets there, sit on the firm's commitment committee. We then bought Solomon. We then merged with Citi. And, you know, all those kind of things changed and the firm morphed. But frankly, in my days of equity capital markets, banking, et cetera, we were always the underdog. We were always the smaller firm. We were always the firm that had to try harder, put out more. And I think some of that chip on the shoulder element has has informed how we go about things as co-investors to make sure that, so to speak, we're Avis, we're not Hertz. What was the impetus for starting Cohesive? In 1999, 2000, I was you know, helping run equity capital markets at City, and I decided I don't want to do this anymore. I'm too old for this. It's a young man's game. I laugh now. I was 38 at the time. And so I went to the senior management of Citigroup and said, this was the top of the bubble, early 2000, tech bubble, telecom bubble, et cetera, Jack Rubman, all kinds of names that'll bring back memories. And I said, you know, we're the only major investment bank or bank that doesn't have a program to invest in private equity. And I ironically went to a guy, Mike Carpenter, who had been my CEO at Kidder Peabody. And he said, what are you talking about? So I went through it all and he said, well, okay, let me talk to Sandy. And surprisingly, Sandy said, I, I like that idea. So they gave me the path and we raised about a billion dollars from our employees to invest in private equity funds and in co-investment. And I put a whole team together. And the big thing there was most people who were doing private equity investing were investing in funds. They probably had 95% of their money in funds and 5% of their money maybe in co-invest. And they also were fund investors. They weren't people who had been in banking or had been in capital markets or really knew corporate finance. They'd come out of pension or consulting or this or that. Good, smart people, but with a different focus. We put a team together that was all direct deal people who looked and smelled and felt like the people they would be interacting with at a lead private equity firm. And this was also what we did. Our money wasn't 98% X, 2%. It was much more balanced. And it was also what people wanted to do. I often had to joke with our guys hey, funds, they may be our broccoli, but we got to eat our broccoli. So we built a great business. We invest that money well. We did really well for our employees. We raised a $3.3 billion co-investment fund in 2006. Believe it or not, that's the largest co-mingled co-investment fund until last year when Harborvest beat that all the way till 2021. But that's how I got into private equity. That's how I learned co-investing and building a team and how we would do things. And everything that we do at Cohesive is from what we did at Citigroup Private Equity. So the core focus was co-investing. What we did was say, let's have a big team and a high quality team. Let's be proactive at working with private equity firms that we want to do this. But most importantly, let's be responsive and let's treat them like a client. And that is the mantra. That is the philosophy of Cohesive. And it was the philosophy. And some of that we do because it's our mindset. And some of it is to do because we built the team to do it. You can't be responsive when you don't have enough people. You can't work with them well if you don't have the right people. 
So you have to have enough people and the right people to make it a good experience. And I like to joke, we do novel things here at Cohesive. When people call us, we call them back. It may not seem novel, but it is novel. People really don't. And ironically, that's as, almost as important as anything. The second thing is people send us NDAs. We turn them in two hours. That's also novel. Then we get materials. And when we get materials here, that's a great day. That's fun. That's like Sunday in the NFL. That's game day. And we read them. And everybody here, and we have a very consensus-oriented approach, a very inclusive approach. And within 48 hours, we want to get back to somebody with a quick no or this looks pretty interesting, what's the path forward? And quick no's, I've learned, are almost as good as yeses. And people often just say, wow, that's just so awesome. You're telling us no, like this quickly, uh, without, you know, drawing it out. And then as we go through that process, be clear, be transparent, be honest, be communicative, and always put yourself in a position that you will not leave someone at the altar. That's the cardinal sin here. And so those were the things that we really discovered and pushed forward at Citigroup Private Equity. I left Citi in early 2009. You know, we had had a new management team that didn't really believe in what we were doing. And I thought it was time to go on and do something new. And by early 2010, decided we were going to start Cohesive Capital. And I'll just point out, you know, a lot of people seem to wrestle with what the name of their firm is going to be. It's a rock. It's a tree. It's a street they lived on. It's a this. It's a God. It's a whatever. And bizarrely, I never had a question. I always knew I wanted to name the firm Cohesive Capital. I believe private equity is absolutely a team sport. Everybody has to play their part. And I absolutely believe the cohesive teams win. We're very proud of that name. And it also has a double meaning, which is we're not only cohesive as a team, but we try and be cohesive with our partners. It's the core element of what we do. And we went out to raise money. Hardest thing I've ever done, by far. We raised over about a year and a half. We got a first close done by November 15, 2010. Have to shout out to the Travelers Insurance Company and to Bill Hyman, who believed in us and was our lead investor. We got a lot of individuals, some people from city, some people from all kinds of different places. And we end up with about $200 million. There's a bunch of things you said that would be head scratchers for other people doing co-investments. So first, you're doing co-investments, but you're not investing in the funds. How does that work? You know, when I first started, there were some people who thought I was somewhere between crazy and stupid. I don't get it. Co-investments come as an LP. What I had learned at City was we weren't big LP investors there. You know, while City was a big place, we'd put 10 million, 20 million, 30 million in a fund for the most part. We did a lot of stuff with people we weren't LPs with, and we weren't getting it because we were City either. You know, I mean, yes, we lent to companies, but lending was a competitive business. I believed that, again, if you put a high quality, good sized team, treated them like clients, were transparent, were proactive, were responsive, were good partners, had knowledge at certain points. You know, we don't ever advertise that we add any value. I think that would be arrogant, but I do believe at times we do add value. We don't get favors. People need our money. They are doing a deal that's too big for them and they need more money. And so I knew from City that people always are doing deals that are too big, whether the firm is 150 million in size or 15 billion in size. We just did a deal with Platinum Equity. It's a $10 billion private equity firm. And we got into a deal, Ingram Micro. So people needed more money. And very frankly, it's much better today. But back then, certainly co-investors weren't as good as not. And frankly, while we have some very good people like Stepstone or Hamilton Lane or Newberger or Harborvest or Adam Street who concentrate this and have real good teams, most of the people who co-invest still have teams that are forced to be smaller than they'd like that are more focused on funds than on co-investments. So there's room in the world. Now, how scalable is this? If you said to me, Ted, I got a little surprise for you. I have a rich uncle and I got $2 billion is the best thing I've ever heard. I don't think we could put $2 billion to work in the way we do it. And I feel comfortable that we can find 17 to 25 deals over a four-year time frame of the kind of deals we like And the funnel always seems to get bigger and bigger, and we keep working that. So you put all those things together. Those were the things I'd learned at City. We are now in 2022. We've done 57 deals with 49 different sponsors. I think that's some level of proof that you can be a successful co-investor. Another piece you mentioned was that you don't pay a carry. So again, there's two ways of looking at 49 sponsors and 57 deals. One is diversification. And another is the sponsors say, well, maybe you're not our favorite. We're not going to come back to you for another deal. So how does that play out? Yeah, you're asking the sort of the second part of how the heck do you get deals with without being an LP and are you getting negatively selected? And first of all, some people believe that co-investment in its own right is negatively selection. I don't patently don't believe that because almost every single deal we do is because somebody needs more money. It's never because like, oh, our normal equity check is 100, but we're only taking 70 here. 99% of the time, it's just too big an equity check for them. They need to reduce the risk. Depends on the firm, but 
Most firms probably these days try to keep a position, to, especially the bigger firms, to 7 or 8%. And some really smaller funds who want to be concentrated maybe get it up to 11 or 12%. And I'd say the norm is 9 or 10%. So around those numbers, you can be pretty sure that they're going to need more capital. And then sometimes it's a little smaller if it's really a buy and build and they know they're going to need more equity capital. But that's really as a percentage of the total. So I don't think there's negative selection in co-investment. Then as it relates to us, I think the simple answer is if you look at how we get deals and the situations, very, very rarely do I feel like we're the second choice. If you're Clayton Dubler and Rice, you have a $15 billion fund, you want to write billion dollar checks. If you have to write a billion four checks, so be it. You're pretty sure, and you have an enormous investor base because you're big. So let's say you have 300 LPs. Well, 100 are too busy, 100 don't like it, but 100 do. And so you're going to syndicate that 400. And by the way, you have a pretty good sized investor relations team that can take a lot of the weight off the investment team to get that all done. But if you run a $400 million fund and you need to write a $65 million check, you can't go naked and write a $65 million check. That's too dangerous. One. Two, you don't have as many LPs. And some people have great and and are very comfortable with their LP base and know that they can co-invest. But some firms don't have that same kind of LP base that really can co-invest. Sometimes a deal is ugly, dirty, hairy, and they don't want to go naked and hope their LPs like it. They want to get us involved early. I'd also say that I'm not sure that if every deal we saw was a deal that every co-investor had passed on, that wouldn't be a pretty interesting screen. We like complex deals. We like things that aren't obvious. We like lower, you know, getting in for lower value, especially with a lot of co-investors. If it's simple, if it's easy, if it's clean, if it's normal, if it's easy to get through committee, those are the ones maybe that get taken up a little quicker and sometimes other ones not so much. But that's not the case. The case is that if I went through with you to invest with us, I could go through 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 deals and explain to you how did this come? When did it come? Why did it come? How did we work the angles of it? And you got to be proactive. You got to be scrappy. You got to be hustling. You got to be ready to grab the scrap when it falls off the table before the dog at the floor gets it. So we're constantly looking. and We try and focus on some newer people who we think have quality. So I'm curious to how sort of in the beginning of that sourcing funnel, how you go about maintaining relationships with lots of firms when doing, as you said, a pace of four or five deals a year, there's going to be a lot more no's than yeses. You know, our sourcing funnel, if you look at it, some of the answer is how do you say no? And that's where that either immediate pass and or quick no's is very, very beneficial. We've had one firm go unnamed, I think has shown us eight deals. And we've said no to all of them. And you're like, why would they keep coming back? And they're a good firm. And the answer is they have situations that make sense for us. And they feel like we've been very responsive to them very quickly and don't waste their time. And so, you know, that's a bit of an odd situation. I would tell you that if you say no to a firm three times or four times, typically, you probably don't want to see any more deals from them. But a lot of it is making sure if you say no in a bad way, that will resonate. And what I mean by that is if you take too long or your answer is, you know, the company makes green bottles and you at the end of the day say, oh, we don't do green bottle deals. Well, you knew it was a green bottle deal at the very beginning. But, you know, we also, you know, a little hint here or joke, which is we try when we say no, more often than not to make it about us, not about them. We don't want to tell them their baby's ugly. They're smart guys. They're thoughtful. It's not like we know more. Sometimes we just haven't been able to see it or maybe it's a real execution hurdle and unless you're going to be able to spend days and days with the management team, you might not get it or this or everybody has different opinions in life, right? And we've certainly passed on some deals that have been successful, I'm sure, and I know. But at the end of the day, I think that's also important. Now, we do have some close relationships who will really push us and like, why did you pass? And if we really like them and know them and, and know it can be, we can just give them a few thoughts and, and they appreciate that too. We've also found that, you know, some people have said, listen, we sit on boards, probably about 35, 40% of the companies we're in, we sit on boards. We don't have control. We don't have any kind of negative vote, you know, or anything like that, but we've been able to add some value. And so I think it's about building relationships. It's about being persistent. One of the things you also find about private equity guys is, especially in today's world, they're very, very focused on what they do, their industry, their firm, their thing. If you show up and know stuff about the private equity industry, who's financing what, what levels of debt are being done, what's going on in some other industries, what are some companies you own, what's going on with some other firms, who's increased from 400 million to 900 million. You know, you know, today, you know something about GP led secondaries, you know, you know about this or that. And frankly, nobody can see me here, but I have a lot of gray hair and I'm turning 61 next week. And so there's also just an element of having built a firm or 
been a bit older and had kids go through school or go to college or go to camp or this or that. I mean, you need to be able to engage with people. You need to build relationships with people. You know, we had a funny thing. There's a firm that we went to see a number of times. It's just north of New York. And in April of 15, I was there and the guy said, you know, John, we really love you coming. We always learn something. It's it's always intriguing. We really appreciate it. But I'm starting to feel guilty because we're never going to do a deal with you. We don't do deals really that are too big for us very often. And when we do, we've got good LPs. I said, ah, don't worry about it. You know, someday you'll need me. And in August of 2015, he called me and said, you were right, I need you. And he had the opportunity to invest, he had a $350 million fund. He had the opportunity to invest 200 something million dollars in a really, really good company. And he knew he needed more than just his LPs and stuff. And then we really got to work at it fast. We were the first ones done. We're going to take a quick break in the action to talk to you about Coinbase Institutional, the first choice for institutions investing in digital assets. Over 11,000 institutional clients use Coinbase's secure, comprehensive, and scalable products to manage their digital assets, including Coinbase Prime and Exchange. Coinbase also recently announced that they're on a path to launching derivatives. As the only publicly traded company with experience trading and custodying crypto assets at scale, Coinbase Institutional executes some of the largest trades in the industry for futuristic companies. Invest with the most trusted name in crypto and learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash institutional. Well, I'd love to hear a little more about the filtering that you'll do when these deals come in. So you mentioned stage, size, sector. What's your sweet spot? Well, first of all, overall sort of investment philosophy. Be curious, really focus on risk reward. I mean, that sounds sort of like motherhood and apple pie. Realize that there are great companies that aren't great investments. And sometimes there are not great companies that are great investments. You can't buy crappy companies. I don't think that works. But there are some companies that are fine, but at the right price and with the right professionalization and the right changes and the right this and some M&A can be really, really good investments. And one of the things I think that's good about going across a lot of sectors is we focus on a lot of sort of Porter's Five Forces type stuff. You know, does the company have a moat? Does the company have a lot of free cash flow? Is the company's margins defensible? What is the competitive dynamic? Where are they stand in that competitive dynamic? What are the changes that are coming that could disrupt or not disrupt? And we try to apply those to every company we look at in certain ways. I would also say, you know, again, we like things sometimes that are a little more boring. I have a joke with the team, which is my favorite companies are there's a guy who lives next door to you and he has a really nice house and he has really nice cars and he goes on really nice vacations and he belongs to a lot of really good golf clubs and you have no idea what he does. You want to buy that guy's company. And an example of that is we bought a company from a 77-year-old man in Port Washington, Long Island called Dijana, now called Outworks. And his company plowed the snow and then melted that snow with proprietary melters at seven of the nine snowiest airports in America. And he made at the time $25 million of EBITDA. That's a beautiful thing to buy. But when, when we talk about sweet spot, you know, for us, sweet spot is we do not do venture. So that's not in the sweet spot. We don't like venture. We have evolved to do more growth equity. For us, growth equity is a real company with real products, with real customers, with real revenues that we believe can be profitable in 18 to 24 months and doesn't need any more money to get there. What we are mostly doing is small to lower middle market private equity. And again, 50% of our deals less than a 250 million total enterprise value, equity and debt. 70% of our deals less than 750. Those are really in today's world, small to middle market private equity deals. And one of the things I also think is interesting is if you have a portfolio and you think about the size of the companies you own as in your public portfolio, you almost own no companies that size because public equity markets have gotten bigger and bigger. Unless you are a super growth, super techie company, you can't get public these days. And that's part of the boom of the private equity industry. Like The companies I took public as a 28-year-old could not go public today. They can only be owned by private equity. So all the companies that are like less than a billion dollars that aren't exciting and don't grow much can't go public and have to stay private. So you know why do we do that? We do it for three reasons. One, our check makes more difference with those small to middle market sponsors. Two, most importantly, we think there's a lot of value in the small to middle markets. So on stage, no venture, some growth equity, mostly LBO. And in that LBO, you know, when you look at our multiples, clearly we're not doing the growthiest of the LBOs. In sectors, really, we're across almost anything and everything. We've had retailers, we've had business services, we've had distributors, we've had consumer companies, we've had oil and gas, which we're not going to do anymore. We've had shipping, which we also wouldn't do anymore. We've had um, some technology, uh, we've had some media, we've had some communication, you know, we've had information companies. I mean, you know, wide, wide, wide range, which is part of what I, I love of this. As it relates to sponsors, this is a very, very important point. 
our sponsor is incredibly important. We are putting our, our money in their hands. So we want to make sure that sponsor is a high quality sponsor, a stable sponsor, a sponsor who will do well in the future, a sponsor who is good at this domain, good at this style, right? There's some people who carve a company out and have to stand it up. That's different than just buying a company that's perfectly situated. There's some companies you buy where you're buying it from a founder. That's very different than buying it from the third private equity firm. There's some people who want to make 23 acquisitions in four years. There's some companies where you're just growing the company more organically. So we think about domain knowledge and style knowledge. And does this domain and style fit that firm? And do we have confidence that they have the capability to not only diligence it correctly, since we're relying on some of that, even though we're triple, double, double checking and going out into our own knowledge network to do that. But most importantly, from the day they buy to the day they sell it, are they going to do a good job with that management team, building that management team, changing that management team, picking the right strategic direction, picking the right M&A, picking the right financing, all the things that need to be done to maximize to get to the best result. Across those range of different companies and sectors that you won't do again, you mentioned a roll up versus a, you know, just buy and grow the original business. What are your preferences and what do you think works best? I think we've decided that very commodity-oriented cyclical businesses don't work in a private equity setting very well. It doesn't help that everybody also just hates oil and gas, and you're better off in more nimble vehicles where you can get in at the right time, get out at the right time, and have more flexibility, especially as a co-investor. As it relates to styles, I think we're pretty open to styles. One of the things I'd say is like, I have this saying, strategy is nice and execution is king. If you look at where we've done poorly, it's because the management team slash the sponsor have executed poorly. You know, it's not too often that we just totally got the thesis wrong. It never happened to us, but you know, you could buy a Yellow Pages company and the Yellow Pages go away, but that doesn't happen very often. Mostly it's been execution errors. And you know, sometimes also I'm a golfer. So it's much easier to hit a, an eight iron than it is to hit a five iron, right? So if the wind's behind your back and you're hitting eight iron, the chance you put it on the green is higher than if the wind's blowing in your face. So obviously, if you have tailwinds, you know, execution's easier. If you have headwinds, execution's harder. But execution, having that management team, making sure they're doing the right things is absolutely important. So we look at how hard the execution lift is. I think some people have done great at buy and builds. By chance, we just haven't done many of them. It's not that we don't like them, but we also will tell you that in the boom periods of the last two, three years, we sometimes saw people buying companies where if you didn't buy a lot of stuff at a very reasonable price and integrate it well, the deal was a 15, 15% IRR. And all the acquisitions would get you to 22, 23. Now we get that, but you know, you've got to buy it all. And how much had this company ever bought before? Now, if this company had been owned by two sponsors and had bought 15 companies each year for the last five years, that's one thing. If the company's never really bought anything before, and now you're going to turn it into an acquisition vehicle, that sometimes makes us a little bit more nervous, maybe. And then also, you know, private equity is a very competitive place. So if you're in a VET roll-up or in an HVAC roll-up, it seems like everybody's got one. So now all the sellers are laughing, they're rubbing their hands together, going, hey, these five private equity guys are all bidding to buy my company. And what you thought you were going to buy at five or six times EBITDA, you're buying at seven or eight times EBITDA after you paid 11 times for the platform, right? You know, and so that can mix things up. And then, you know, maybe it just takes a little bit longer. I wouldn't say we're against that at all. It's just, we haven't found ones we've exactly liked. So you know, a little bit of motherhood and apple pie. You know, we, we like high quality companies that have enough growth, that have a significant moat, that have a lot of free cash flow. Free cash flow is a beautiful thing, right? You know, every day you're in effect paying down the mortgage. And so even if you don't grow much, you're making money. So you talked a bit earlier about building teams and your big team. And I'd love to hear what's underneath you in executing the strategy here at Cohesive. So I don't do very much well. I'm not that smart, not well-trained in finance. You can find hundreds, thousands of guys who are better at tearing apart companies. But what I am good at is picking people. And then, interestingly, having them work well together and enjoy it and like it and stick together and work as a team. How do you do that? So one thing is everybody works as a team. You know, one of the things I've never liked about private equity and people say, well, they did that deal or I'm doing this deal. It's we do these deals. And it might not work for everybody else, but when we get stuff in, everybody gets all the materials. Now, we have people who lead a little bit more and lead a little bit less on each deal, especially mid and lower levels. But there isn't a deal where everyone has read all the materials. If we have a crucial call, a couple hour call with a sponsor to go through things, almost always all of us will be on it. When we call, have a call with management or not always if we go see management because that's a little more awkward. But, you know, we have a lot of people involved in that. And, you know, I'd like to say, you know, yes, I lead the firm as a firm. 
But from an investment standpoint, I view it as a democracy and as consensus and that I'm what I call the conductor of the orchestra. My job is to make sure everybody is talking, everybody has an opinion. What do those opinions sound like? Do they sound like they're educated or not? Do they have biases in them from their biases that I've come to learn? One of the things we established, and an interesting thing I think about investing in private equity, was somebody came in as a fund. We were doing funds at, at City. And they told us they didn't have a unanimous investment committee vote necessity. Really interesting, because everybody always says, we're all unanimous. I said, well, why not? And he said, well, if you have everybody unanimous, then no one wants to be negative during the process. And nobody wants to say, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. Okay, I'm good. So let somebody say they don't like it and say no. And I really thought that was genius. And so we don't have unanimous here, although it never really comes to a vote. But the idea is I want, if someone wants to be negative, be negative. Try and test the people who like it more. Now, you may be negative to a nine and nobody else is more positive than a five. Then the conductor sort of going, hmm, think we should go away. If I got four people who are eight and a half and one person who's negative a five, then that's something we should be moving hard on, right? So, and then also the person who's a bit more negative, go test it with the person who's more positive and let's talk about why you don't like it and why they do. And let's try and unpack those things a, a bit. So very consensus oriented, very inclusive, very not hierarchical. If Stephen has a really good idea, our, our most junior guy, then God bless. And, you know, we, we next week or week after we have a new young woman starting as our first analyst. And I hope we take her opinion just as strongly as we take my opinion. I'm curious, being in this market for a long time, there are a lot of the interest in co-investing coming from, say, primarily fund investors looking to reduce their fees, increase their exposures. What have you learned that could help those people be better at what they do? First of all, be careful that you invest to lower your fees. You know, I know a lot of politicians and other people attack pension funds. Oh, look at all the fees they paid. Well, how about just looking at the net returns? There is a correlation between getting good results and sometimes paying higher fees. That's one. Two, one of the things I think people do in co-investing sometimes is they get their sizes wrong. They get their portfolio screwed up. So let's say you're a, a private equity investor who puts $25 million into a fund. That means typically you're putting two and a half million into a company. If you then go into the co-investment business and put five or seven and a half or 10 million in a co-investment, you're getting your portfolio out of whack because you're only doing one deal and maybe that deal's bad. You shouldn't have all your positions from your funds as two and a half million dollar positions and a bunch of your co-investment positions as five, seven and a half and tens. And why would that happen? Well, because sometimes you need to be that big to get included. Sometimes you need to be that big to justify why you're bothering to do it. Sometimes you do that big because you really think you love it, even though you know none of us are smart enough to know it's going to be perfect. As it relates to just what could they do better, first is you got to do what we've done and what some of our better co-investor colleagues have done, which is you have to build the right team and the high quality team and the size of team. You have to have people who are direct investors and direct investors first and spend a lot of their time, if not all their time on that. And you have to have enough people to be able to react quickly and be responsive and work with a sponsor. I think the other thing you know we do a lot of is we don't just look at the deal from the sponsor and look at things. We have a whole secondary level of diligence we do. You know, we have a great, what we call knowledge network, whether it be sometimes our investors, but we know bankers, we know traders, we know salespeople, we know hedge fund people, we know private debt people, we know people in industry, and we have some really illustrious people. We know people who can get us to other people. Very often, you know, it's not when I call the guy who introduced us, Jeff Solomon, and ask him for some help. It's not Jeff who can help me. It's he knows somebody who can help me. That's a very important part. We've had some very, very meaningful calls outside of the diligence process of the lead sponsor that have pushed us very much towards a deal and very much against doing a deal. So that's the hardest part for them. And then the last part is the stuff I talked about before. You need to be able to move quickly. You need to return phone calls. You need to turn NDAs quickly. You need to say no quickly. You need to be responsive. And I think some people have gotten that more. I also think some people have gotten that more in this bull market when it's sort of been easier and everything's been working. And we'll see what happens as we maybe go towards a little bit less of a ebullient market. And some all of a sudden people realize that some of the deals they've done in the last three, four years aren't going to work as well. And they get a little more nervous about what amount of work they need to do or don't need to do to waive in this fee-free, carry-free candy. I'm curious to get your perspective on the environment going forward. What are you excited about? What concerns you? You know, it's a tricky world. And we've been doing this since 2011. And I think to be a good investor, you need to be a cynical optimist. We've clearly been in a pretty incredible time. The economy's done well. Interest rates have been low. Credit is everywhere. The cost of the credit is low. And the amount of the credit is high. You know, a lot of people say, oh, what happens if rates go up? You run an LBO model and you take rates from 6% to 8%, it does not matter. 
If you all of a sudden can only borrow four times versus five times, that changes the math. And by the way, the answer is simple. You just bid less, right? Because we're all solving for one number. That's 20 to 25% IRR. And so we'll look what we think the company can do. The second part is just enthusiasm, right? We've had endless enthusiasm. And, you know, I do think there's been a bit too much enthusiasm, a bit too much willing to go too quickly, accept pro forma adjustments. 10 years ago, nobody even knew what ARR stood for, right? Annual recurring revenue. So now we're not only buying companies, certain companies, you know, software companies off of revenues, we're buying them off of annual recurring revenues at the time you did it, et cetera. And especially in the growthy venture world, it's been accentuated. I don't think it's been as bad in the LBO world, but I do think there's been some excesses. And so what you need to undo that is a little prick in the balloon. And with the pandemic, which actually in some ways accelerated things, but then with the super duper stimulus and now what seems like pretty scary inflation in many ways, we see it in our portfolio companies and raising interest rates and then energy shocks and geopolitical challenges and all kinds of things. I think it's taken a little shine off. Now, there's still just a ton of money out there. And supply and demand, you can't beat supply and demand. And, you know, it's interesting. There was an $11 billion LBO done recently called Anaplan by, I think, Toma Bravo. Interesting, that deal was financed by, I think it was four or five private debt firms. No bank involved. Unthinkable 15 years ago. An $11 billion LBO, all financed by private debt. That's pretty amazing. And what that tells me is they're in business they have the hold capacity so that unlike the banks who at these times get very nervous because they're in the moving business, not the holding business. These private guys are in the holding, mostly holding a little bit of moving business, which allows you to be more aggressive and more confident in these more turbulent times. So while it's been slower so far this year, partly because it was so busy last year due to people trying to sell things to beat the tax changes that never happened, I think it's been pretty clear that it's been slower the first three, four months of this year. There's still plenty of deals being done and, and aggressive deals being done with aggressive financings. I've never been good at a crystal ball, but I think you'll see a little less enthusiasm, but I still think you're going to see very active markets. But where the biggest bloom is going to be off the rose is in the, I think, in the venture, in the late stage venture, in some of the really early stage growth equity type stuff, because look at what happened in the public markets to a lot of those companies and their prices. All right, John, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Well, luckily I get to mix my favorite hobby or activity outside of work with work and family, which is golf. I'm not a very good golfer, but there's nothing I like more than being on a beautiful day on a beautiful golf course with people I like. And God bless my wife plays, my son plays, my son's a lot better than me. But also it's a great way to meet people from work and get to know them in a different way. And I think you learn a lot about people on the golf course. I absolutely love golf and it's my my happy place. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? I guess uh, maybe there are two sort of things sort of related. One is people being late. And the other thing is people not calling back promptly. I don't think anybody's that busy that they can't call back. How about on the investment side, your biggest investment pet peeve? The number one is running after the hot dot. You know, I just think some of the biggest mistakes in life, the growth telecom thing and and the tech bubble, you know, in the 99, 2000 timeframe, I think there's going to be some real carnage that's come out of the most recent two, three years in some of the, what I'll just call overall venture bubble, because it's not just tech, et cetera. And then I guess I would also say just being closed minded not having an open mind to think about things. Now, people might say, well, John, you're being closed-minded because you don't think some of these new great ideas are great ideas. But, you know, when I see some big, big, quote-unquote, venture firms doing what seems like almost a deal a day, a deal every other day, it just doesn't seem practical that's being done well. But I may be wrong. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Well, the one I would say from a personal level is clearly Mike Carpenter, who I call my business dad. You know, Mike was the CEO of Kidder Peebo when I got there. I was 27. He was 43. By chance, you know, we both left Kidder, and, and he ended up at Traveler slash Citigroup as well. And he just taught me so much. He's very, very smart, very strategic, but more importantly, just how to be better in a business setting. He's always just given me really, really good advice. Maybe from a slightly different perspective, I guess I'd sort of say Mike Milken. We talked about Drexel Burnham earlier. Mike really changed the world. There are plenty of people who make a lot of money in finance. Then there are people who changed the world. Mike Milken changed the world. Little, small to medium-sized companies, the, the American dream were not easily financeable. Those all little banks went out of business and, or got merged into all our big banks. So if we didn't have the high yield market and the, and the private debt markets and all the things that came out of Michael's revolution and understanding to finance small to medium-sized businesses, uh, I don't think America would be where it is 
today. So very interesting and and an openness to understand that getting rid of bureaucracy, being nimble, being quick, having people own their own companies, equity ownership, all those things, the things that really have led to what private equity is. Michael was the first step in enabling private equity to be what it is today. What's the biggest mistake you made and what did you learn from it? I mentioned we raised that very big co-investment fund in early 06. It was a boom time. It was the the heyday, so to speak, of private equity LBOs, very big LBOs, multiple partner deals. And there was a lot of needed extra capital. And we were you know, right in the middle of it. And we had a big fund. And we put a ton of money out in 2006 and 2007. In retrospect, that was too quick. And we did get some of them right. We got some of them wrong. I'm proud to say that fund still ended up being about a one and a half and an eight. So not so bad. But What it did lead me to learn from it was, I do believe a key part of private equity is investing across time. And so we're very, very focused at Cohesive that we'll invest over about a four-year period of time. And, you know, a lot of people in the public equity markets talk about dollar cost averaging. And if you think about private equity, it has a lot of benefits. One of the elements that people don't think a lot about is that private equity has a dollar cost averaging element to it, which is if you give somebody a commitment in 2023 and they put that money out in 23, 24, 25, and 26, you know, that you've gotten some dollar cost averaging across a lot of different elements of values of markets, values of commodities, interest rates, all the different things that can help and, and impact and hurt an investment result. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? It's funny. I, I stated earlier that I had two obviously very, very smart parents. They weren't very pushy about teaching me. They were also just tired out from my brothers and sisters. But I guess two things. One would be just search for knowledge, be inquisitive, be always learning. My dad and mom spent most of their time reading. You know, they did hiking and some skiing and some other things and traveling. But even when they traveled, they were always learning. So always learning. And then I guess I'd also say be humble. They were very special people, but they had no airs, no arrogance. All right, last one. John, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? One is listen more and listen better. And the second one would be be more patient. I'm not a very patient person. I'll sort of add to that. You know, I have a saying that I talk to people about, which is that people's weaknesses are their strengths boiled over. And I think if you think about most people, you'll say, yeah, and some of the most successful people just know how to keep the heat exactly right. And it never bubbles over. And people who don't have strengths don't succeed. And so how do you balance your strengths with not overdoing your strengths? I would say that in my 20s, a lot of my strengths boiled over and sometimes could get on the wrong side of people and the wrong side of situations a little bit more. And coming back to Mike Carpenter telling me how to modulate at certain times. And then I just overall think being patient is a good thing. Like most people, I do a list in January of New Year's resolutions. And I think for 37 years in a row, be patient has been on the list, unfortunately. (laughs) John, thanks so much for taking the time. That is a really real pleasure. And thanks for doing this with me. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at CapitalAllocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. 